Scripture lesson today comes from the wisdom literature known as Ecclesiastes. Let's share in God's good word together. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Love and happiness. Something that can make you do wrong. Something that can make you do right. Mm. Love and happiness. I get used to this. Good. In 1972 in Memphis, Tennessee, Al Green recorded one of his biggest hits, Love and Happiness. The song was inspired by his own personal struggles with love. He had recently broken up with his longtime girlfriend, and he was searching for answers. Maybe you've been there. Green said that his song, Love and Happiness, is about finding love, finding happiness, and keeping it. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about this next month. We're going to do this over and over these next few weeks. But I'm here to tell you, love and happiness it has a lot more to do with God and you than your ex-girlfriend. <laughs> All right, that's fun. Will you all give them a hand? That's fun. I love the A and G on his lapels. It's so good. Al Green. So if you have your sermon notes, I invite you to take those out. We are talking about love and happiness, but it can be hard to find, can it? But in part because it's hard to define. It's hard to define. Now, so this almost never fails. Would you like to be happy in 2024? The answer is? Yes, yes of course. Now, who here wants to explain what happiness is? Right? Well, some people say, well, you know, it's when you're not sad. That doesn't help. <laughs> right? it, it, is, it, it can be really hard. Like, what, what exactly is this happiness that we all long for, we search for, we want this? People say, well, what do you want for your kids? Well, we want them to be happy. Sure we do. But well, part of the problem is that language gets in the way. In, in Spanish, for example, there are a number of words that talk about love. But in English, we just have the one. It's love. And so, love. You can love this, you can love that, and it can be completely different things. But in the Bible, they have lots of words for love. They have phileo, storge, eros, and agape. Everybody say agape. Agape. That's what we're looking for. That's God's love. And so you say, well, what are all these different words? Well, phileo is brotherly love, right? Oh, isn't that sweet? Oh, right? Now, brotherly love. It's like Philadelphia, phileo, the Greek. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Or you have storge, which is uh, familial love, right? For brothers and sisters, moms and dads, aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas. I mean, this is a beautiful kind of love, uh, and it's, it's worthy of, of admiration and respect. But most people, when they think of love, particularly in the West, they think of romance, right? And, and I don't know about you, but when it comes to romance, I'd rather be on the beach on a sunny day than in the rain with an umbrella. But you know, this, is, this is romance, right? And then we do come to agape, God's love. And how do we know about this love? Well, first of all, through Jesus, of course, but also through the scriptures that tell us about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and that direct witness to our spirit. So what does the Bible say about love? What is this agape love that God has for you and for the world? Well, in the Gospel of John, it's very clear. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's exactly what Jesus did. Now, that's a, a love worth getting into, studying, giving your life for, which Jesus did, change the whole world forever. So when we talk about love, really what we're talking about is will to good. Say will to good with me. Will to good. It is our will that whatever we are focusing on, whether that's a thing or a person, a what or a who, we want the best for it. That's what love does. It wants the very 
next best thing for whatever it is that we love. And that, that's really what love is. Um, this concept largely comes from a mentor of mine, Dallas Willard, who um, I studied under for a number of years when I was working on my doctorate uh, in spirituality and church planting. And so he, he talks about love uh, in ways that, that, that help me a lot. And so one of the examples he likes to use is he say, we may say that we love chocolate cake, right? Looks good, doesn't it? But we don't. We don't love chocolate cake. You don't love chocolate cake. Do you want what's best for that little piece of cake? No, you don't. You want to eat it, right? You want to lust it. You desire it, right? You do, you're not going to do what's best for that cake. You're not putting it up on the stand and, you know, shellacking it. No, you want to eat it. And, and another piece, if they'll give it to you. So, so we want to eat it, but, but friends, that's desire. That's not love. And the problem with desire, of course, is it only leads to more desire. And anybody who's ever struggled with any sort of addiction knows this. I mean, that's just the way the world is. Now, you think something's going to bring you pleasure, you go for that, it's fleeting, and you, you want that again or, or something greater. So again, Dallas would say, in our culture, we have a great problem distinguishing between love and desire. But it is essential that we do so. And, and one of the reasons um, is that from time to time, it happened to him, it's happened to me, uh, a young couple, shortly after they've had children, will come in, and they'll basically say, they don't know they're saying this, but what, basically what they're saying is, we're too tired to lust after one another anymore at the moment. Which I'm like, well, join the club. I mean, anybody who's had, you know, littles under five, particularly more than one of them, knows, well, there's seasons where you don't have energy to do anything. I mean, it's just all you can do just to, to show up for one another. And that's because we're, we're trading or confusing lust and desire with love, which is what do you do best for the person you love? What is, would be best for them? And so we, we come to this idea of happiness. What's going to make you happy? Well, will this car make you happy? Will this spouse make you happy? If your kids make good grades, will that make you happy? And then we come to a really important question, which is, does God want you to be happy? Does God want you to be happy? Well, sure. Sure he does. But it's more than that. You, know, you say, well, what do you want for your kids, Pastor Mark? Well, you know, I'd like for my two boys to be happy. But I want more for them than that. I want them to be men of character. I want them to do something with their life that changes the world, that, that helps others. I, I want them to be people who are moral and kind and considerate and are illuminators, not detractors, not diminishers. I want them to be people uh, that people can rely on, that their word is their bond. There's all sorts of things that are equal or greater than happiness that I wish for them, hope for them, pray for them. And so, yeah, God wants you to be happy, but not just happy. And, and this has been sort of a, a debate or a concept from the very beginning of our faith. Irenaeus is, is first as the first century. He said, the glory of God is man fully alive. And he's right. The best thing you can do is to live into the full life that Jesus has for you. It's a great witness to the world. Be like, oh, look, they're on fire. They're, they're doing great. Look at this. And, and you know this if you're watching the Olympics or a sporting event or artwork or music. When it's done to an excellent level, when you are using all of the gifts that God's given you and, and you're in that zone, it is beautiful to behold, isn't it? And you're just drawn into it. The glory of God is man fully alive. And a few hundred years later, Augustine would say, there is no one who does not wish to be happy. We all want to be happy. Now, at least that's what people say. I think I've met some people that really don't. They just like being grumpy. But for the most part, most of us, we really do say and want to be happy. And why is that? Well, partly because happiness is powerful. It is. It, it changed your world, changed the world around us. Um, one of the people that I would recommend that you look at is the research from Martin Seligman. Um, he did research, he's a, he's a uh, PhD, and he says that of the 2,282 U.S. residents over 65, those who reported as happy were half as likely to die and half as likely to become disabled. They simply had much better lives. Now, to be fair, we all die, but those folks were dying less fast in, in his study. And so here's the thing about happiness. Chasing it will make you miserable. I mean, if your focus is on happiness, you won't ever find it. You'll just be miserable because as soon as you think you're there, then it's, it's gone. It's like mist. It's vapor. And, and King Solomon, he had the most money. He had the most of everything, and he was wise. You might remember that he asked the Lord for wisdom, and the Lord gave it to him. And, and this is what he writes in Ecclesiastes. 
Solomon said, I said to myself, come now, I will make a taste, a test of pleasure, which he did. Enjoy yourself. But again, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it's mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I search with my mind how to cheer my body with wine, my mind still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly. And not that your Christmas break, you were looking for laughter, pleasure, and wine? I mean, nothing's different in the world. And, and he says, but, but it just it didn't amount to anything. He says, until I might see what was good for mortals to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. And I even made myself pools from which to water those trees, the forest growing in the trees. He says, I bought people, something we don't have access to in the same way today. I'm not recommending it. It's terrible, but he's writing from, from his experience where he, he could own anything he wanted. If he saw it, he could get it. I bought men and women, male and female slaves, and had slaves who were born in his house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem in the history of the world. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and of the provinces. And then I, this, this next part's cool. I, I think I'd like to do this one day. I got singers. Wouldn't that be cool? Like, hey, wake me up with a song. And that'd be fun. Yeah. No. So both men and women singers. And, and he had every delight of the flesh and many concubines, uh, which are not wives, but are people that you would have sex with, and, which was legal and okay in that day in that way. Uh, by the hundreds, by the way, if you study that. So he had everything he could possibly want. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. All my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Anything he wanted, he did. I kept my heart from no pleasure. He writes, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had spent in doing it, and again, say it with me, all was vanity and a chasing after the wind. You ever tried to chase wind? Can't catch it any more than you can catch happiness. And then he says these words, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Not a thing. I don't know what you're thinking. I should not have come to church today. This is depressing. <laughs> I'm going to chase everything in the world. It's going to amount to nothing. Just missed. And part of the reason we can miss this is because we don't know what happiness is. And we can confuse other things with it, like pleasure. But pleasure is not the same as happiness. King Solomon's very clear about that. He had all kinds of pleasures, but he wasn't happy. So what, what's the difference? Uh, John Mark Comer has done some work around this that I think is pretty helpful. He says, pleasure is about want. Happiness is about freedom from want, right? Contentment. He actually goes further than that. He, he would actually say that uh, pleasure is about dopamine. It's a dopamine hit. And happiness is about oxytocin, the chemicals that are released when you're in right relationship with others. So what is, what is this happiness that we search for, and sometimes wrongly, um, by seeking it in pleasure, which will not end well? Well, part of the reason it's hard is that people don't define it the same. There is no universal understanding of happiness. And so the West thinks of it as one way, and the East thinks of it as another. The world is pretty much split in half the way they think about happiness. And so it's, it's just defined differently. So in the West, right, if you were to ask your kids... You know, what would make you happy? They're going to say to win achievement. They're going to say, if I win the, the state basketball championship, I'm going to be happy, right? If I make the, the team, I'm going to be happy. If I start, I'm going to be happy. If I make straight A's, I'm going to be happy. If you take me to Disney World and I ride all the exciting rides, I'll be happy, right? Excitement and achievement in the West. That's what happiness looks like. But that's not true on the other side of the world. In the other side of the world, if you, if you look at Eastern cultures, what people desire is peace and calm and contentment. Well, if we're all trying to get happy and half the world thinks of it like this and the other world thinks of it as the exact opposite, what are we going to do? That's never going to happen. So it's got to be more than pleasure and excitement and achievement or contentment. Yep, it's a lot more than a feeling. It's a lot more than desire. It's a lot more than a culture. It's actually a byproduct. Happiness is not a destination. It's a direction and a connection. 
I've known people who were super happy that were up and in, and I've known people who were super happy who were down and out. I've known people who were happy that had the strongest of health, and I've known people that were happy that were dying of cancer. The whole gamut, I've seen it all. Happiness does not have to do with your circumstance. It has to do with your relationships with God and others. But this is where we're starting to have a problem, particularly in our country. It's actually global, but particularly in our country. A recent Harvard study found that 36% of respondents, more than one in three, feel lonely almost all the time. All the time. You, you, you understand, this, this is not how it used to be even 10 years ago. But with the emergence of social media, and it's not just social media, it's the way we've chosen to allow social media to work in our lives. So... Um, I'll talk more about this in the coming weeks about relationships. But um, if you look at when social media started, particularly Facebook and Twitter, they, they allowed you to connect with relationships, which was a great thing. People really celebrated that. Oh, I can, I can meet a friend from high school, or I can keep track with these friends that where I used to live. This is all good because your feed used to be, right, most recent to past. That's the way it was, if you can remember back then, pre-210, Right? And so it, it could be annoying because you had to wade through all the stuff to get to where you wanted, but you, you had a sense of what was actually happening in real time. And then they developed the like button and the share button. And when that happened, depression rates skyrocketed and flourishing took a nosedive. Why? Because people were no longer connecting. They were performing because they wanted people to like their stuff. They no longer shared their real stuff with their friends they started becoming influencers, and they started putting stuff out. And so we've trained our, a whole generation of kids not to have authentic relationships, which would actually give them stability and foundation. We've taught them to perform, to perform and perform and perform. And when they don't get the number of likes that their friends think they should get, they get depressed and suicidal. It, it's really dangerous stuff. And so that like and share button, if, if you do a deep dive on that, you will, it'll make your hair... St- Stand right up on the back of your head. And, and so it's no surprise to me, and I ought not be a surprise to you, that for those who are young, our young people, 18 to 25, it's almost double that, that's 61%. Because they've lost real deep, meaningful friendships where people care for one another. So when we, when we talk about happiness, there's, it is, pleasure can be a part of it, enjoyment can be a part of it, but it's more than that. Happiness, uh, according to Arthur Brooks, who spent the second half of his life studying happiness, it's connected to communion, to real relationships with people. It's connected to satisfaction in your life's work or in an achievement. It's, it's connected to your purpose that what you do actually matters in the world. And when those all come together, happiness just pours out of your life. It's just all around you. You almost, you almost can't help it. So Professor Arthur Brooks says it like this, to get happier is to get more of these elements in a balanced way. Enjoyment, satisfaction, purpose, all of those balance. Because if you just achieve, you won't be happy. And some of you in this room have achieved amazingly well. Some of you had straight A's through high school, straight A's through college. Some of you have built businesses and sold them, built other businesses and sold them. You have achieved everything that anyone could possibly expect you to achieve, and you are not happy. It's just not there. It's, it's fleeting. It's, it's gone. You have more than you could possibly use or spend, but it doesn't make you happy. Right? You, you have to have some sense of purpose. You have to have some sense of satisfaction in your life. And so over the next number of weeks, I'm going to talk about four key areas that Brooks found that actually are scientifically proven to matter to your happiness. Now, these are not anecdotal. They're not just things that Pastor Mark thinks about. Uh, these have been studied uh, over decades. And the, the first is pretty simple. You, you know this right? Uh, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, right? And so the, the first area is family. Um, I remember when our, our boys were in high school, um, I had somebody say to me, you know, Mark, parents are only as happy as their most unhappy kid. I was like, that's, that's kind of true. You know, if you've got six kids, but one of them's struggling, you're not having a great day. You're worried about your kid that's struggling, Your family relationships are core to your happiness, core to the way you experience life, core to the way you see the world. When when family's not right, nothing's right. It's just all off of balance. 
And so sometimes when I've, I've had colleagues or, or folks that I've worked with and they, they come in and they're all torn up, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got a 90% chance of getting this right. There's something wrong in their family. Their kid's sick or you know, they're, they're struggling in their marriage or, you know, a parent died. And that's just the way it is. I mean, if your family's not working, nothing's working. And then, of course, the second is very closely tied to that, and that's deep, lifelong friends. Friends that you can really share with. Not, not people you're performing for on social media, but actual real friends. And, and of course, the other is that you do need meaningful work. That, that, that you have to feel like you're doing something in the world. And then, and finally, you would hope I'd get to this, your faith. Right? Your faith. But uh, to be transparent, it, it doesn't actually have to be Acts 2. It doesn't even have to be Christianity. Um, there are people who will worship um, on their Sabbath at Temple Benai, Israel, and they, their faith makes a wonderful difference in their life, in the Jewish community. So I don't want to, don't mishear me. Now, I'm all in for Christianity. It's my job. It's what I do. Um, but um, the, the idea here in, in the happiness studies is that you've got a, a larger gr- group of people that care for you and you care for them together. And most importantly, I want you to know, you can get happier even if you have problems. A, a problem-free life, one, doesn't exist, but two, even if you could get it, it's not going to make you happy. And so I've seen people that, that had really tough situations, and they were happy all the way through it because they were connected to God, they were connected to others, and they knew it didn't matter what came their way, they were going to be okay. And, and if you've been around here long, I try to tell one of those stories as often as I can, like with Glenn Simmons. I mean, he's remarkable to me. And he's been in prison nearly you know, 50 years for a crime he didn't commit, and, and he's still going. You know, he didn't give up. A number of years ago, Chantel and I had the, the great privilege of going to a class for two weeks on human flourishing. And, and one of the speakers was Catherine Hart Weber. She's a PhD student. Um, and she says this. I promised you this in the newsletter. There's one thing, the strongest predictor of satisfaction with life. Anybody know what it is? Gratitude. Gratitude. And, and I don't mean just, you know... I. I I know it can be like, oh, yeah, Pastor Mark's going to write down three things I'm happy for, blah, blah, blah. Because you've heard that stuff. But, friends, this is the difference in life and death. This is the difference in happiness and despair. It it reframes everything. Because it doesn't really matter what happens to you. What matters tremendously is what you do with what happens to you. And if you can, as the Bible encourages us to do, to give thanks in all things, not for them, but in them, you'll change the world, change your world. Now, I don't know who said this, but I really like it because I think it's true. And that is that no amount of regret changes the past. No amount of anxiety changes the future. But any amount of gratitude, any amount at all changes the present. Even the most little bit. Because of what I do um, as a leader in a community, sometimes people get upset with me. Even if it doesn't make sense. And, And then they'll send me a really hateful email. Uh, or maybe a, a really long voicemail. And, and, and I don't even understand it. I don't know what's going on with them. All I know is that they're hurting and they're really upset with me. And so what I find is that if I will call them and I say, Hey, I got your voicemail or I got your email. What's going on? They respond great. All they wanted to know that I was grateful for the relationship, that I cared about the relationship. And what do you know, more often than not, that's repaired. They're just like, oh, I just, you know, I just needed somebody to actually see me, to respond to me, to know that I mattered to our community. Even the tiniest little bit of gratitude, even in the midst of conflict. So that's happiness. When it comes to love, the Bible actually has a lot to say about love. Not least important, that God is love. And that God loved us before we offered any loving response That's the most important thing you can know today, that God loved you before you even had the opportunity to love him. He loves you because he loves you because he loves you. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more or less. It's his character that he loves you. Say this with me. God loved us before we offered any loving response. In 1 John, it's written this way. Beloved, agapeteo, that agape word. Let us love one another. Because, say it with me, love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For, say it with me, God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son, Jesus, into the world so that we might live through him. Clifton Black is a New Testament professor at Southern Methodist University when uh, I was there. 
Um, and he wrote uh, the study on 1 John. And this is one of the things he said about it. He says, God's love for us is the source of our power to love God and one another. Even our ability to love God is because God loved us first. And then Paul would say, so don't brag about it, right? And then, and then we come to a hard truth that if you understand it and you actually act on it, will change your life for good. And that is you can't make anyone love you. You just can't. And the sooner you figure out that, the better your life's going to be. You can't make anyone love you. Everybody has free will. And you can't make God love you. Not any more or any less. God loves you first. Too late. He beat you to it. He loves you. In, in the same way that mothers love their children while they're in utero. They already love them. They're not waiting for them to come out and pass a test. Right? They love them because they love them. And 1 John says, in this is love. This is what love looks like. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Sent his son to be this atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, agapateo. Since God loved us so much, we also ought to do what? Love one another. Right? So, 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 so. We really get this because we live in a world of meritocracy. Now, that is not our Christian faith. Our Christian faith says this. That God's love for us does not depend on our love for him. And it does not depend on... On our faith. We don't have faith in our faith. We have faith in the love of God. Amen? Because if it's, if it's faith in our faith, then we're all messed up. We, we all have no chance. Our faith is in a God who loved us first. And it's not just in John. It's not just in 1 John. Titus also says this. At one time, we too were foolish. right? They're, the writers of the Bible are, are incredibly transparent. They, they, they don't pretend that they have it all together. Like, no, we were disobedient. We were deceived. We were enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That was all true in their lives. But when the kindness and love of God, friends, the kindness and love of God changes everything. Kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but, say with me, because of his mercy. Because of his mercy. That's why he loves you. Because of his mercy. And so Dr. Weber would say, you flourish in the presence of God's love when you actually receive that and the attachment with others. So when you're in right relationship with God and you're in right relationship with others, you're good. It doesn't matter what comes your way. You'll be able to stand. You'll be able to move forward. And, and that's why, as I look at the cross, I always think of this center beam as the relationship between God and God's people and the cross beam between God's, God's people and God's people, right? Love God, love one another. That's what the cross shows us. But here's the thing, friends. There's only one way to know if you really love God. And there's only one way to know if somebody else loves God. And that is if you love one another. That's it. I didn't make that up. Professor Black says that's exactly what the scripture is saying in 1 John. That the only authentication that you know God is by loving one another. That's the only way the world will know. That's the only way you'll know. Why? Because God is love. Say it with me. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So here's the thing. This doesn't bypass the judgment. I mean, you're, we're all going to stand before God one day for the things we've done or not done. But here's the great news. If you are already living in the love of God, if you're already responding to the love of God, if you are in daily conversation with the Lord Jesus, you're looking forward to that day. You're not dreading it. It's just another day in the kingdom for you because you're already doing it. You're already living into it. The scripture says we love because God first loved us. That's why. Those who say I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are... <clears throat> liars so if you meet someone who's being ugly to people online they don't love god they don't if you meet somebody who treats you well and treats the waiter badly they don't love god if you have somebody that knows the scriptures forwards and backwards and they have hate in their heart and they they put themselves over and above people and put the others down they don't love god we gotta get clear on this because a lot of people say they love god and they have zero fruitfulness to prove it the only way we know people love God is if they love others. That's it. And, and, and he goes on to say, because those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. 
I mean, if you can't even get it right with people right in front of you, how dare you say that you're going to get it with somebody who is completely other and beautiful and wonderful? I mean, it just it doesn't, it doesn't add up. And so, and, and by the way, in the scripture earlier, it says no one has ever seen God. And so they, he's doubling back to this. The commandment we have from God is this. Say it with me. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Agape. Agape, not just family love, not just brotherly love, not just romantic love, but real self-sacrificial love. So the prospect of standing before the bar of God's judgment, Dr. Black says, it holds no terror for those growing up in love. Not at all. We look forward to that day. So the love of God in our hearts and lives can change our future and transform the world. That's why we're here, to practice for heaven, to love one another well. And and I know it, it can be difficult. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't even even know what that looks like. I've I've never even seen that. I've seen, you know, transactional uh, things that people call love, but that's not what you're talking about. I've seen these other things, but that's not what you're talking about. What are you actually talking about? Well, in 1955, there was a woman named Mamie Mobley. Some of you know this story. She's the mother of Emmett Till, who was brutally murdered by two white men. And, and people tried to cover it up. They didn't want anybody to see what was going on in the South. And Mamie said, no, the world needs to know. As hard as it is for me, as hard as it is for our family, the world needs to know what's happening here. And so she was interviewed, actually, afterwards. And, and the, the reporter asked her, she, he said, do you harbor any bitterness or unforgiveness towards the two white men? Or towards whites in general, actually, for the brutal murder of your son? In 1955. And this is what she said. She said, well, it certainly would not be unnatural not to hate them. Yet, I'd have to say, I'm unnatural. The Lord gave me shield. And I don't know how to describe it myself. And then she, she, she said these words. I did not wish them dead. I did not wish them in jail. If I had to, I could take their four little children, they each had two, and I could raise those children as if they were my own. And I could have loved them. I believe the Lord meant what he said, and I try to live according to the way I've been taught. And that's a different kind of love. And that's a love that will change the world. And that's the love we're striving for. A love beyond ourselves that the world does not and cannot know without the power of Jesus. And so I invite you to receive that into your life, the very transformation of your soul in the world. And so the way we live that out is actually pretty simple. The next time uh, you leave this place, just ask yourself in every situation, what is the most loving thing I can do in this situation? Over and over again, what is the most loving thing I can do? How do I will good for the other in this situation? Whatever it is. And then, do it. Do it over and over and over again. So oftentimes we think that there's this magic bullet. We're nice to someone one time and we think we're in. We're done. No, it doesn't work that way. Every time in every relationship, every day we ask, Lord, what is the most loving thing I can do for this person? And then we do it. Whether that's in our family, our friends, our work, our faith life. Over and over again. I invite you to pray this prayer with me. And then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. God of mercy, whenever I lose sight of you and I'm tempted to doubt your heart or goodness, turn me again to the clearest sign of your generous mercy, your only son, Jesus. Lord, I trust you with my relationships. I trust you with my future. Help me wait for your direction. Help me move when you call. Amen. And now with the confidence of children of God, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.